my friend. It's a beautiful uh, evening to have a uh, discussion of good things, the clean things of God. And I just wondered if, if I could throw a psalm your way, if we could maybe spend just a little bit of time with one of those, if, if that sounded good to you. Sure, that sounds like a plan. All right, let's, uh, let's invite folks listening to get their scriptures. And my friend, Psalm 125 is on the agenda for tonight. And I love it when we do our takes with each other because I've had a chance, of course, to prepare, <laughs> and and you have not. And so because of that, there'll be a little asymmetry in some of the things, and you'll go in the direction that you'll go in, and it'll frankly be fresher. And then I'll have a chance to bring some of the things that I had that I, I had a chance to look up. So I hope they're complimentary, and I love doing these things with you, my friends. If that sounds good, I'll get started here. Welcome to Generous Theology. Today, Chuck and Brock talk about Psalm 125. And I'll start with reading the Psalm 125. This is the NIV version, a song of ascents. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Lord, do good to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Peace be on Israel. Now, Chuck, you have mentioned in the discussion of some of our other psalms that we have read that are also psalms of ascent. You have mentioned that there's a good reason to consider contextualizing this psalm as a song that was perhaps sung as God's people from the nation Israel would, would go to the temple of the Lord and as they, would, as they would climb the steps, as they would make their way to proceed into the area of worship. And uh, I thought, what a beautiful picture of calling, uh, God's calling, and our responding to him, and the joy of, of getting to go to the Lord's house, the Lord's temple, to meet with him, to treat with him, <laughs> and to uh, participate in the activities, those good divine activities. And so I really loved this psalm for what it brought in that regard. And so just giving you a chance to, to maybe just start off cold, as I mentioned, con contemporaneously might be the right way to put it. What about this psalm strikes you, and what are some of the themes and uh, major emphases that you were struck by? Yeah, first of all, yeah, as you noted, we know that these psalms of ascent, these songs of ascent are, were, were sung by the people of Israel as they went up to worship at the temple and went up the climbed the, the mountains that surround Jerusalem to, uh, to go and worship. And so there's something really, this psalm, it's short, but you can actually, maybe even more so than some of the other ones, you can actually almost consider the setting as you're doing that. You can imagine the people of Israel climbing, you know, these mountains that surround uh, Jerusalem and they're going up and they're going up and they're marching to Jerusalem. And it's, it's probably hard work getting up there because they're climbing and they're climbing. And maybe they, they got to have the kids who are straggling behind, get them to catch up, help some of the elderly people get, get up the hill. And so they're singing as a way to help this happen. And then as they're singing, they talk about that those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which is the, 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 the mountain that Jerusalem is built on. And as the mountains surround Jerusalem, and as I understand it, you have to really climb high to get to Jerusalem. But then when you get to Jerusalem, it's actually in a little depression, maybe, at the top of the mountain there. And, and so you come up, you get to the peak of the mountain, and then as you get to the peak of the mountain, Jerusalem there in this in, in, sort of in this, not really a crater, but kind of in this little depression surrounded by the mountains. And you and it's, you've been looking forward to getting there. You've been looking forward to going and worshiping with the people. I, I think of that um, Psalm of David. I rejoiced when I heard them say, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so you got these people who are rejoicing to get there. And 
And as they're thinking about that, they're like, yeah, God was on our side as, as we were on our way. And just as the mountains that we just climbed surround Jerusalem and were in some ways a barrier, made it difficult for us to get there. But in, in the same way, the Lord surrounds his people. And now that we're in Jerusalem and we've got the mountains surrounding us, we've also got God's uh, protection around us. And then from that picture of what they've just experienced in that climb and what they're seeing in the, the scenery around them, they take this lesson of God's surrounding his people, his protecting them, his not allowing the wickedness to, to rest on them, but rather allowing the righteous to, 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 to continue in their righteousness and their uprightness and, and God blessing them uh, in that. And then there's that last piece about peace beyond Israel. And that, that word peace, that word shalom, is really about so much more than just lack of warfare, but it, it's so much more than that. It's about all the right relationships that, that the people of Israel have with each other and with the nations around them and with God. And it's just this beautiful picture that, that we see, and it takes in not just the, the scenery around, but then brings in what we know of God. So it, it, it really is a, when you know that context, and I remember hearing that, that context a couple of times in some sermons from pastors that I've sat under, it's just really a, a beautiful picture here. Amen, my friend. What a beautiful psalm this is. I think the first thing that struck me um, was the presence of mountains. So the, in the first verse, it says, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. And so you have this idea of the mountains conveying something that is everlasting, that cannot just be whimsically and mutably altered. And think about it, Chuck, what in our lives lasts? I think it's not a surprise that, for example, they place gravestones, markers for graves that are very often made out of solid rock and have inscriptions carved in them. And I think the idea is that this loved one we are laying to rest, even though they're not here, even though they're not living in this land, still we honor them with that memorial. And in a sense, that small headstone represents sort of the enduring nature of rocks and mountains. Verse 2 says, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. So there's a protection here. There's, there's a providence. God has put these mountains to keep us between evil and us and to also adorn the landscape. And I have uh, I thought about this very interesting poem that has come out of a different context. It's a poem from uh, Chinese poetry, and it's called uh, Zazen on Qingting Mountain by Li Bai. And the poem says, the birds have vanished down the sky. Now the last cloud drains away. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remain. And so we have this picture of this everlastingness of God and, and how it transcends the mutableness of us, the changeableness of us. Chuck, not only did I just mention earlier that nothing around us lasts, in some sense, even you and I fail to last through the ages. The ages change me. They change you. They change people. That's what it means to live, to get older. And what is that? What a powerful consideration that is against the contrast of the ageless God, the eternal king. And here we are, beings of but a moment. What does the mountain motif mean to you? Yeah, the first thing I thought of when... I read uh, along with you that first part of the text, and, and you were reading it in the NIV, and I had quick grabbed the first Bible that was the closest one to me, which is my ESV. And uh, I noticed that in, in that first verse, the NIV uses the word shaken, that, that Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken. And in the ESV, it uses which cannot be moved. And <clears throat> that immediately struck me because I know that those kinds of word choices, you see those similar kinds of word choices in, in the NIV and the ESV. And Psalm 46 is one of my absolute favorite psalms, one of my absolute favorite texts. And 
in Psalm 46, it talks about God being our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in, in time of trouble. And so even though the earth may be moved or it may be shaken and the, the mountains fall into the sea, we can still rely on God as our, our refuge and strength. And, and so there's this picture there even of uh, how God is even greater than the mountains, that he's even more permanent and even more fixed. And, and then you think of these people who are coming up to Jerusalem, and depending on when it is in, in history, perhaps their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents and their great-grandparents had done the same thing throughout the history of Israel. Or, or maybe we're talking about after, after the restoration of the temple and the, after the exile, people singing this psalm again and thinking back to how this was the way it had been done before the exile in, in time that they can't even necessarily remember. And here are these mountains that are still the same. And what we know about Mount Zion, what we know about the mountain of Jerusalem, this goes back, the history of this mountain goes back you know, to, to Abraham, when Abraham took Isaac up onto the mountain and was going to sacrifice his son, and, and God uh, calls down to him, and the angel of the Lord says, stop, Abraham, don't do this, and, and then provides the ram as a, a replacement uh, for Isaac. And, and that's a picture of what's to come. It's a picture of the Messiah. And so these people who are singing this song of ascent as they're going up to worship in, in Jerusalem, they have, this, they have this amazing picture of these mountains, which seem like they could hardly you know, be moved. They, it's, they know that it's been the same this way since the time of Abraham, which even for them was a thousand or more years before, it's just an unimaginable period of time. And yet we also hear the echoes in the, that word about the mountains being moved, can't be moved or, or can't be shaken. We hear that reference to Psalm 46 as well, which says that God is even greater than that. He's even beyond that. So I, I don't know. I just, that, that picture of the mountains, and perhaps it helps. I, I think you, I know you, where you're from, you probably grew up seeing kind of the mountains around your area. When I lived in northern New Jersey, we lived up in the Ramapo Mountains and up in, at my house. I could look from my house and look around and see the mountains around us. And out in the distance, I could see the, the, as the mountains got a little taller and in between the next ridge of mountains was the Wanakee Reservoir. And but it just seems, you know, that was permanent. And, and I remember many years later going back and visiting and just driving up the, the mountain and going up to the uh, little development where that house was. And on the one hand, the house itself, as often is the case, when you go someplace you haven't been in a long time, maybe where you grew up, it just house looked small. The house looked not particularly impressive, other than a few things they'd done to it. They terraced the, the front lawn a little bit, which was impressive. The house still looked small, but then as I then turned around and looked to in the direction that was downhill from my house, and that's where you're looking off to the northwest and, and you're seeing the, the mountains there, it, you know, it, nothing had changed. It was just as amazing uh, as it always has, had been. And so now, We've got this picture of, of God as being even greater. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's an amazing picture. And I just love how as much as we can, and it's great to do this, as much as we can dig into theology and dig into philosophy and, and think about some of these really deep thoughts and how does the mind work and what's the relationship between the mind and, and how we think about God and, and how do we think about ourselves. And yet there is outside of us, still, that the scripture uses these things that are around us in nature that are just a physical part of, of what we see every day and use it to make these pictures that help us to understand and to believe. And yeah, so I, later I moved to Iowa and it's nice and flat. And I don't know, maybe somebody who's lived their whole life in Iowa would, would love an image of the, the plane going off forever. But, but for me, who did grow up at least part of my childhood in the mountains, it's, it is really a a beautiful picture. Yeah, thank you for that, Chuck. It's so true. Having spent some of my youth in the mountainous region of the uh, Appalachians, I can tell you that I really enjoyed living in those beautiful uh, mountains. I think where the part where I lived, they could maybe more adequately be called uh, gentle rolling hills. I'm sure 
a friend of mine from the Rockies could look at me and say, ha, you call those mountains. But there was something special and beautiful about God's creation that was communicated to me in that in that purple mountain majesty, to borrow the famous expression from the song. Now, there's an interesting verse in here. Verse 3 says this, The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. Now, why? The verse continues, For then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. That's really interesting. What is that speaking to? What is that talking about? Now, Chuck, I'm going to throw you in the deep end here in just a moment. But before I do that, so that it's not quite cold, I did check with my Matthew Henry commentary to just try to get a sense of what might be uh, going on here, being communicated. And uh, we can have a little bit of interaction back and forth with it, if that helps. But one of the things that the Matthew Henry commentary says about that verse is this. It says, God considers the frame of his people and will proportion their trials to their strength by the care of his providence, as well as their strength to their trials by the power of his grace. Oppression makes a wise man mad, especially if it continues long. Therefore, for the elect's sake, for the elect's sake, the days shall be shortened, that whatever becomes of their lot in this world, they may not lose their lot among the chosen. Now that's really pressing on me, Chuck, perhaps in its unflattering portrayal of of me. I sometimes I have this thought that I will be everlastingly faithful to righteousness and to goodness. But this verse here seems to throw out, or at least hint at, as Matthew Henry says, that God tailors the days that people face precisely so that uh, they are able to bear their burdens in this life. And it's maybe humbling for us to consider as creatures that in the presence of evil, even with God's aid, my sinful frame can perhaps not stand up in light of eternity. And is that going down a right direction with that? Or are there some other things going on here, Chuck? What does it strike you when you hear it? Mm -hmm. 